Hello, I'm Sanjeev Goyal, uh, director of the Cambridge Inet Institute, and uh, I'll be talking to Larry Samuelson. Uh, Larry is visiting us from Yale, where he's a Malamed professor of economics. Uh, welcome, Larry. Uh, it's been lovely having you here, and uh, uh, we'll be just talking very briefly about uh, one or two things that you, you're very excited about, about your research. Uh, so, so perhaps, you know, uh, a good place to start would be to, to, to give us an uh, give us a sense of uh, what you've been doing while you've been here. Uh, sure. I, I'm nearing the end of my second week here. During that time, I've given three talks of varying topics and level and emphasis. But the most important thing I've been doing here is talking to people. And that may sound kind of pedestrian, but research comes out of people comparing, combining, debating, working on ideas. And for that to be effective, you need to get together and spend lots of time talking to people. I see. Would you uh, like to tell us a little bit about maybe uh, your, your, the, one of your talks? Sure, let me talk a bit about the, the third talk that I gave. Its title was Dynamics of Inductive Inference in a Unified Model, which sounds perhaps a bit opaque. At the core of economics is a model, a vision of how people make decisions. Everything in economics is built up from thinking about how individuals make economic decisions or decisions more generally. The standard approach to this throughout the vast bulk of economics is to assume that people are perfectly rational, maximizing or optimizing decision makers. When faced with a problem, they identify all of the factors that influence the outcome, all of the possible things about which they might be uncertain, all of the <coughs> ways that things could turn out it's as if they make a, a list of everything that might affect the outcome of their decision, and then they go through it systematically and ask, what would be a good thing for me to do if this happened? What if this happened? What if this happened? How likely are these things to happen? And out of this sort of calculus of decision making comes an optimal thing for them to do. That's been a very powerful model. It's proven to be quite useful in examining all sorts of things, financial markets, lots of allocation of resource, lots of policy questions have, <coughs> we ha have yielded to that kind of technique all sorts of insights that we can use. On the other hand, that's a very stylized, very demanding notion of how people make decisions. It seems to be a quite good approximation in some circumstances, not in other circumstances. It in particular seems to fall down as the problems start to get more complicated, more novel, mm -hmm. as people have to make decisions in circumstances where they don't have lots of experience, lots of history they can observe, lots of other opportunities to identify all the factors that might affect that decision. And so I was talking about work designed to ask how would people decide in these more nebulous situations, circumstances where they may not know what all of the relevant factors are. They may not be able to attach relative likelihoods to outcomes. I think it would be good if you gave us a sense of maybe an example of a kind of situation where you know, the standard model would, uh, you know, would, 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 may not be the best way, maybe one or two examples. So let me give a, a range of examples. And start with, every week the U.S. Treasury auctions Treasury bills. If I were interested in behavior in that circumstance, I would feel relatively comfortable using the standard auction. These are familiar objects. Mm -hmm. They're pretty well-defined objects. The people in this auction have a great deal of experience with it. The decisions are important. Huge sums of money trade mm -hmm. hands at these auctions. And they have implications that reverberate throughout our financial markets. But that is a relatively well 
understood circumstance. Next example that's somewhat less so. One characteristic of our financial markets recently has been the introduction of a whole collection of relatively new financial assets. <coughs> mortgage-backed securities, bundled mortgages, credit default swaps, various other derivatives. I would be less comfortable using the standard model to talk about people investing in those kinds of markets. They have less experience to guide their decisions. Mm -hmm. The decisions they're making are about objects that are less familiar. Much harder for them to identify all of the circumstances and all of the implications of those circumstances for their decision. Now let's go one step further. Let's look at a financial market that has all of these things trading in it. And then let's add some event, like the <coughs> collapse of a couple of financial institutions in 2007 and 2008. Now we're really in a situation that's relatively unprecedented, where people I think have little guide as to how their decisions should work. And to think there that they can just enumerate all of the possibilities, attach probabilities to uh -huh. them, and do a, a, a well-defined calculus of decision making just, uh, just doesn't seem plausible at all. Want to go one more example. Think if we're having to make, let's go outside of financial markets, a decision such as should we intervene in the <coughs> conflict in Syria? Should we engage in a democracy building exercise in some other country? Uh -huh. How should we react to the Arab Spring? None of these, I think, are well analyzed by our more traditional decision-making models. If I were to uh, think about innovation, uh, which is one of the sort of key movers of, uh, of the economy, so is, is there a sense uh, that if one were to think about the internet economy, you know, um, is there a sense in which these new platforms, these, these new um, revenue models, is, would that, in your view, be also an example of a situation where the standard uh, way of thinking about these decision problems would be, uh, would be you know, problematic or might be difficult to accommodate? I would say surely. The standard model assumes that we understand every aspect that's relevant of the situation. Any innovation challenges that view. Any significant innovation like the sort of bursting onto the scene of the internet or of computer technology more generally should and does cause us to think maybe our existing models were wrong. Maybe we, or obsolete would be a better word. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Maybe we need a new model, a new way of thinking about what we're facing. And any time we're doing that, we're into a realm of analysis of decision making that we just don't understand as well. So how does the work that you present uh, presented last week, how does that help us move forward in, in understanding what kinds of models or what kinds of approaches might take us beyond the standard model and, and you know, how could it help, for instance, um, in analyzing those problems, but also how is it different, if you like, from the standard approach? First, it's important to recognize that there's a progression in doing economic research. We start with models that are pretty abstract, pretty far removed from reality, models that someone might think are hopelessly incapable of telling us anything about the world. But these basic abstract models then feed through to more applied models, which in turn feed into empirical work and policy implications. And the, we need this whole process before we have some economics that are actually going to affect the way that we 
think about the economy or the way we do things or the way we set policy. And the work I was talking about is at the very beginning. We're at a quite abstract stage. We're dealing with what looks like an exercise in mathematics. And <coughs> the standard model is based on, again, a mathematical core, namely Bayesian reasoning or Bayesian updating that describes how people process information and how they make use of information to refine their beliefs about the uncertainty that they face. And the work I was talking about gives us a generalization of that model of how people refine and make use of information. The delicate thing in doing this is to get a model that's more general than the standard model we know, mm -hmm. but still has enough content to be useful. The easy thing to do is to produce another model that's so general that it is consistent with any kind of behavior, or so general that it makes no predictions, has, has no content, mm -hmm. and then we haven't gotten very far. One reason we have used the standard model for so long is not only that it has in many situations proven useful, but it has a very nice, crisp combination of analytical power of making predictions mm -hmm. and, and tractability. And so we are exploring generalizations of that model that we think will be more useful in examining how people react to these innovations, to these complicated, unfamiliar situations, but that are still, uh, still have enough content to, to be useful. Now, to, to, to be useful is a speculative part. It's yes. going to take a lot of work right. and, uh, and a lot of moving down this chain before that actually shows up as a practical tool. So sort of looking ahead, uh, what, what do you see as you know, the big questions in, in this line of work? There are just a host of still open, important questions in this work. Ultimately, what we're trying to do is study human behavior. It has long been a tradition to characterize economics as a study of resource allocation, but I think it's more aptly characterized as the study of, of human behavior. Any time that people are making decisions, economics is potentially relevant. And what we're trying to do is get a better idea of how people do that, especially how people do that in situations that are not very simple, very controlled, very well defined. So what are the sorts of interesting implications or interesting questions? How do people use information? Some information seems to have a great effect on people's thinking, some does not. Mm -hmm. Where's that boundary? What determines that trade-off? What information do people seek? What information is valuable? How does information spread from one person to another? All of those are interesting sorts of questions that we don't have a great understanding of. How do these sorts of considerations, like information, interact with other things that affect people's decisions, their emotions, the social context of their decisions, the effect of others on their decisions? How do these individual exercises in collecting, using information, making decisions, how do these interact? Mm -hmm. Economics, people are both social activities. How, does the, how do the individual interactions combine to shape the, the aggregate outcomes? How does it matter who people interact with, who mm -hmm. people are connected to? Is, is another whole scope of, of interesting questions.